Hello, welcome to the Church 360 Ledger Transactions Reports and Reconciliation Webinar. Hi, my name is Rod Kyles and I am the manager of Concordia Technology Solutions Support. Um, I've been with the company a little bit over 18 years and I really appreciate the opportunity to serve churches. You can reach me one of two ways. Of course, you can send an email to rod.kyles at cph.org. And if you'd like, you can give me a call. Uh, my desk phone number is 314-268-1315. Um, I kindly ask that you mute your phones and or microphones and post any questions you may have into the question window. It'll be located, um, in most cases, on the right-hand side of your screen. Joining me today is going to be James Bowman. He's one of our support technicians, and you may have actually spoken to him in the past. Um, he answers um, emails, and of course, he answers some um, support phone calls as well. You can reach him at james.bowman at cph.org. You can also reach him by phone at 314-268-1409. Okay, so um, what we do with these webinars, they all have basically the same structure. Um, we'll start out with a class agenda, so we'll kind of explain the structure of the webinar. Then from there, we'll um, go through a class overview. The overview is where we detail each topic that we're going to cover during this training webinar. So. Um, once we've detailed all the topics, then we'll jump into the discussion. This webinar is set for 90 minutes, and um, usually I'll try to break about, so 10 o'clock right now, so 10.45, 10.50, um, no later than 11, then we'll have a short five-minute intermission, then we'll resume and we'll cover the um, second part of the um, discussion. So, um, and we'll kind of just break it up that way. So then from there, we're going to have our quiz. It's a short quiz. I promise no pressure during the quiz. If you miss a question, you know, hey, no worries. Um, so and really, it's just to tie up loose ends and possibly foster some other questions. From then, we'll have our question and answer session. Of course, you can ask questions uh, along the way. But if you, um, you know, if you want to save them to the end, feel free to do that as well. OK, so. Let's go ahead and go through our class overview. We're going to start out by um, talking about transactions. And the first part is conventions. There's going to be parts of our transactions that are the same in every single transaction. So we'll start out with conventions. Um, we'll also talk about debits and credits. This is dual entry bookkeeping. So um, basically, you'll have um, two transactions, two transactions, two line items on every transaction one being a credit and one being a debit. You can have multiple line items on a transaction, but as a minimum, you've got to at least have two. So we'll talk about pending transactions, um, show you how to manage your transactions. So there's going to be times where you'll need to edit transactions and void transactions. So we'll um, oh, also creating recurring transactions, but there's different things you'll need to learn um, when it comes to managing your transactions. From there, we'll trans um, transition. We're going to be talking about transactions, but we're going to transition into reports. Um, there are several different reports inside of Church 360 Ledger. Um, some of them, I call them canned reports, like they're already predefined by the programming team, so like they're canned. Um, but there's also other reports. So the first of the canned reports is the general ledger. Um, we also have a balance sheet inside the program, the chart of accounts report, and there's the balance sheet report. Oh, I have the balance sheet report on there twice. General ledger report, statement of income and expense, chart of accounts report, and balance sheet report. So um, the fourth report is actually the statement of income and expense. So after we get done reviewing reports and showing you the canned reports, we'll also show you some of the other reports inside the system. Um, there's you know, custom reports that you can create will detail those reports. And there's reports that are in other parts of the program as well. So we'll go through those reports as well. So we'll show you how to do a bank account reconciliation, um, go through the event log, then we'll have our quiz and we'll have our question and answer session. So um, after we get done with our question and answer session, um, that'll be the end of this training session. We'll then, uh, I guess, move on to our next task, I guess, go to lunch or work some in Church 360 Ledger or whatever we need to do at that point in time.
Okay, so I'm excited as, um, as you can tell, I hope you're excited as well. If you're ready, I'm ready. Let's get started. So I'm gonna go ahead and switch screens and switch over to Church 360 Ledger. And I'm gonna turn off the webcam so that we can focus in on the screen and um, not focus in so much on, um, on my head there. So um, give me just one second, I'll do that. And everybody should be able to see my Church 360 Ledger screen. Um, whenever you go to access your Church 360 Ledger site, you're going to go to a subdomain. So um, all of the domains are going to be .360ledger.com. And this one's called Learn. So basically, we gave it a title for these types of demonstrations, these types of trainings. And we call it Learn.360ledger.com. Then from there, you can go ahead and log in, and I'm going to log in with um, my um, email address, rod.kyles at cph.org, and then I'm going to log in with my password. If you forget your password, you can use forgot your password, and um, if you did not receive the unlock instructions, you can click on that as well. Then um, you can also sign in. So we're going to go ahead and sign in to Church 360 members, uh, Church 360 Ledger. Okay, there we go. And once we're signed in, um, we're going to land here on the, um, I like to call it the transactions view, but you can think of it as your home screen. I'm going to say um, no to this message here at the top, so I'm not going to save my password. Um, all of the main web browsers give you the option to save your password inside of the web browser. And for some systems that make sense, um, for some computer systems, for some programs that make sense, I'm not going to save it for this system, though, um, since it is our financial books. And if saving it means you can automatically log in, that, that might be a little problematic there. So, Okay, so now that I'm logged into Church 360 Ledger, We'll land here on the home page and it'll say home here at the top. Um, to navigate back to this page at any point in time, you can click on the orange dollar sign and then that will allow you to access this page right here. When it comes time to create your transactions, you're going to want to do that by clicking the new transaction button here at the top of the window. And then that's going to give you the option to click on any of the transaction types that you can um, create inside of. Church 360 Ledger. So there's five um, here in the system. There's transfer, deposit, payment, check, and journal entry. So there's five of them. Um, and when it comes to deposits, you can you know, create a deposit manually, but you can also pull the deposit here from the pending transactions tab. And we'll talk more about pending transactions here in just a second. I do want to switch back to my PowerPoint. There we go. Transactions. And um, I have a few slides on transactions to kind of um, kind of further illustrate some of the nuances and some of the things that we're going to want to look for when working with transactions. So transactions, um, there's several conventions, and these are going to be things that are similar throughout the software. And and um, inside of here, similarities, if I click, let me click one more time, there we go. So um, when it comes to these similarities, conventions is what, what I like to call them, what we call them here. These are going to be um, things that are similar. So every transaction must have a date. So it's one of those non-negotiable things. Whenever you're entering your transaction, it has to have a date. And that date is going to tell the system where to apply the balance or apply the amount for that transaction to your balance. There we go. Every transaction has the option of including a descriptive memo. Um, it doesn't do line item descriptions, but it does do transaction memos. So you can put a memo on every single transaction and every transaction um, has to have a minimum of two line items. So when we're working with transactions, we know we have to have um, no less than two line items. You can have three or you can have four or you could have 20, but you have to have at least two. And then the fourth thing here is the debits and credits must balance on all transactions. So when we're you know, working with our transactions, they have to be balanced. And um, you'll be able to visually see that here in just a moment, but literally you have to balance every transaction. 
transaction. So you may have a thousand dollars worth of credits, but you'll also see need a thousand dollars worth of debits for that transaction to be able to be saved. And we'll go through our debits and credits chart here um, on the next slide. So debits and credits, and um, sometimes people will call it the T chart, transaction chart. And when you're working with your debits and credits, when you um, you'll notice one thing here initially so it says credit and for an asset that's a decrease lots of times i think in our heads we think credit as an increase but really it's considered a decrease so um with the debits and credits chart this chart is going to allow you to be able to um, see the results of what will happen when you create a transaction and um, most times you don't use this a whole lot with checks deposits um, checks, deposits, payments, and, and transfers, but you'll definitely use it when you're dealing with journal entries. So um, the credit and debits chart will help you get those journal entries into the system the way that you um, want them to be so that the items increase or decrease accordingly. So if you're working with an asset, to increase it, it's gonna be a debit. So whenever you do a deposit, you're actually debiting the asset account and when you're writing a check you're crediting the asset account and you can kind of think about it like this um, when you're doing a deposit it's going to be a debit on the asset account and when you're doing a deposit in most cases it's going to be a credit on the income account and both of those items you'll notice are in the increase column so the balance will actually be going up both in your assets and going up in your income accounts so both are actually increasing it's not always the case where both will be going in opposite directions like when you're writing a check so like we're looking at our asset line here and it says decrease and it's going to be a credit so we are so we are decreasing our asset account but if you go down and look at the expense line item it's going to be a debit so to balance that transaction we'll have to debit the expense account so um in thinking about this this is not something you have to have memorized and i don't have this chart memorized i keep a copy of it either taped to the bottom of my monitor or i write the copy out prior to um, the start of one of my training sessions so that i have it with me and i actually have it written down on a little piece of paper here for today's session and i'll reference that when we go through and start doing our um, transactions i do want to pause just for one second and since we're going to be doing journal entries here in the next few moments i want to ask that if you have pen and paper there to take a moment and write out this um, credits and debits chart this transactions chart and um, basically let me look at my watch here we'll just give ourselves 60 seconds just to write this down and um, when when we get done writing it down, we'll have it and we'll be able to kind of reference it while we're looking at transactions here in just a moment. So um, we'll pause just a second. We'll have a moment of dead air there and we'll go ahead and give everybody a chance to write this down. And the big benefit of having this debits and credits chart is you can tell what's going to happen beforehand. I know I just said that, but that really is the big benefit. So let's pause for uh, about 30 more seconds here and give everybody a chance to write the chart down. Okay, that's been um, about a minute and 10 seconds. So I'm gonna go ahead and um, move on to the next slide. And um, I'll, I'll bring this screen back up here a little bit later on, but it, it'll definitely be a benefit if you have it written down. Um, I do wanna read the note that's down at the bottom of the screen. The money in a restricted fund is held in an asset account. So when we speak about restricted funds and we're going to be doing some transactions here in just a moment um, if you have an asset account a checking account it can be broken up into restricted funds and with those restricted funds being in the system they'll have their own balances 
And um, that money is going to be a representation of what's inside that asset account. Okay, so let's go ahead and go to our next slide here. Okay, and um, what we're going to do is we're going to start out with the transaction type of deposits. So um, deposits, there we go. Deposits allow users to deposit money into an asset account. Examples of deposits are examples of reasons why you would use deposit is to enter in Sunday offerings, also to track rental income. These transactions are limited to assets and income accounts. One thing that they wanted to do with this software was to make it easy to use. And one of the ways of doing that is by preventing mistakes from happening. And one way that they did that was by limiting the transaction just to assets and income accounts. There are people who want to deposit into liability accounts. If, um, excuse me, if that is the case, then if you would, um, if, if that is the case and you'd like to do that task, please post that in the question box and we'll take that feedback and pass it on to the development team. But at this time it's just assets and income accounts. There we go. Um, this um, deposits do integrate with Church 360 members. And the next slide is going to be checks. So, and we're going to show um, integrating your deposits from or integrating your batches from Church 360 members into, um, into Church 360 Ledger. Okay, so first we're going to show you how to manually create a transaction inside of Church 360 Ledger. To, to manually create a transaction, you'll go to new transactions here at the top. You'll click there and then we'll start with deposits. We'll show you how to uh, manually create a deposit. Then from there, we're going to show you how to uh, pull a deposit in from Church 360 members. Okay, so when, when your transaction comes up, you'll notice that there's a little drop down box here at the top that allows you to switch between transaction types. Uh, we're going to go back to deposit. There's going to be memo and we're going to call this Sunday offering then we can go over here and we can select whichever date that we want and it does allow you to enter in dates in the future so if you need to you can select a date in the future you wouldn't do that for a deposit but there are times that you do so for checks so you can you know enter a transaction for the future we're going to say that this is sunday but the deposit went in on monday so i'm going to select the 24th of september and then the option for payee is available on every transaction, but you'll only use it when you're actually making payments. So below that, there's going to be assets. And inside of this drop down list, you'll select your assets. So it says unrestricted. Um, that's going to be where any money that you receive through Sunday offerings that is unrestricted will go into that line item. Um, on the right hand side, you can select your income accounts. So if it's unrestricted, it's probably going into the general fund for income. And then you can select different assets and in different income accounts. So one question would be, why would you need to select more than one asset account? Now, this system, the way that it works is it allows you to put more than one asset account inside of the transactions. So um, you could have a deposit that's going into two separate accounts, but you could also have a deposit that has unrestricted and restricted funds on the transaction. So an example would be you could have a building fund, you could have a memorial fund, you could have a mission fund, and you could have a scholarship fund. Memorial fund and... Hmm, Memorial Fund. I'm going to click the circle minus here and start that over. Okay, so Building Fund. Building Fund. Memorial Fund. Missions. Okay, it's working now. There we go. Okay, so... Um, you could select the different restricted funds that are part of this deposit. So 
Um, in our Sunday offerings, we had people who gave money that was unrestricted, but people also gave money to the building fund, they gave money to the memorial fund, and they gave money to the mission fund. So on the right-hand side, there's going to be the general fund. These are going to be our income accounts. And you can type in the drop-down box, mission fund, memorial fund, building fund. And it looks like there's no um, memorial fund inside of the system. So building fund, and I'm going to take off the uh, memorial fund. Then. So I'm going to use a circle minus to get rid of that. So usually I like to select the accounts first and make sure that what I have here on the right-hand side makes sense with what I have on the left-hand side. So say that to the general fund, they gave $3,000. Then to the mission fund, they gave $1,000. And then to the income account, they gave $1,000. So as I type in these numbers here on the right-hand side, it'll build a balance over here on the left-hand side. Then what I'll do is I'll go in and type in the dollar amount for the building fund and then the mission fund. And then as I'm typing, it'll subtract that balance. And then I'll type in whatever the unrestricted is last. And the reason why I like to type the unrestricted last, I allow the software to do the calculation for me. So if I know how much is in the unrestricted fund, I can go ahead and type that in. But if I don't know, then I could type in the restrictions first and then let it reverse its way um, backwards into the number. So that allows me to save the step of pulling out a calculator and um, running, the, running a tape at that point in time. Okay, so at this point, I would actually have completed the task of creating the deposit. So I'll go ahead and click on save. And then that'll save my transaction. It'll automatically show up here inside of our um, home screen, our transactions view. And we'll be able to see those line items. And looking at it, you'll notice how it says mission fund, building fund, and unrestricted. And it shows each one of the amounts for those line items. This view isn't a view of transactions. It's actually a view of um, line items. And the home screen shows a comparison of your assets versus your liabilities. So here on the home screen, you'll see how it's um, assets, uh, $434,969.39, and then liabilities of $73,475.30, the difference between those two is going to be what we see here, $361,494.09. So this running balance is kind of like your fund balance for your system because it's assets minus liabilities. So that's literally what we're seeing on this screen. Now, in working with this, you'll notice we have 456 pending transactions. What are pending transactions? Pending transactions are a combination of two things. They're going to be offering batches that are being pulled over from Church 360 members into Church 360 Ledger, and they're going to be reoccurring transactions like pastor salary, like depo uh, direct deposit for pastor. So those are recurring transactions. So those are the two things that you're going to see underneath pending transactions. What I want to do is for those customers who are Church 360 members customers and are Church 360 Ledger customers, I want to go into Church 360 members here just for a second. Um, Church 360 is an umbrella product name and it has three um, products underneath that umbrella. One is members, Church 360 members, the other is Church 360 Ledger, and the third is Church 360 Unite. Members is the church management software. Um, Ledger is the checkbook, the financial component. And then Unite is the website building part of the program. So um, in looking at this, I've logged in. I'm going to go to offerings. And I'm, I want to show how the offerings kind of transfer over from Church 360 members over to Church 360 Ledger. I'm going to show a real basic um, offering entry step here, but we'll be able to see the handoff. So um, to create a batch in Church 360 members, usually this view is on offerings, but you'll see all your offering records in here. You'll go to new batch at the top. 
um, you'll select the date of the offering. And I'm actually going to select the 23rd since those offerings were given on Sunday. Um, if there's an event in the system, you can attach it to the event. Then you can click Add. Then that will take you into the offering entry view where you can um, go through and we're just going to we're going to select um, Dave Abbott, say that he gave um, either to check. Actually, reverse that either to cash, check, payment or gift in kind. So and it has a keyboard option. Let me grab my, my number pad here. So it has a keyboard option where you can type in the numbers and basically go left to right. So if I press number one, then press enter, and then you say he gave to the general fund, press enter, and then say he gave um, $1,000, then press enter. So there's Dave, and then we'll do Sally, say she wrote a check, press number two, I can type in the check number, one, two, three, four, um, say that she gave to the building fund and say that she gave $1,000. And then, um, so 103, Troy and um, say that they gave electronically. And I want to do the missions fund. So I'll say mission fund. I can type characters or I can type numbers and then press enter and say that they gave $1,000. And then um, say 104. I can type letters for entering in the names as well. So we could say Jeffrey Alexander um, gave cash say that that was to the general fund and a thousand dollars so um then i just want to do one more let's say 104 um cash and let me double back just one second and refresh my memory mission funds okay so it's the memorial fund that i don't have an example for and then i'm going to do a thousand dollars here as well so um five thousand dollars once again once the batch is in the system um It'll automatically save and it will hand it over to Church 360 Ledger. So I'm just going to refresh my screen here, reload. And I did that by pressing F5 on my keyboard. Um, you can use the reload icon here at the upper right as well. So you can reload that way if you like as well. Um, so then at the top of your window, you'll notice how it says, yeah, there we go, it went from 456 to 457. And one question may be, why is that number so high? Like, why is there 457 items in there? Um, this is a sample or a test database. With this database, we've got, you know, all kinds of people, of uh, all kinds of um, support people, salespeople using these databases and they add things in. Plus, also, if you import in from Shepherd Staff, then it'll show all of those transactions as well. So that's why we're seeing so many transactions. Um, so in looking at this, that deposit is now here in the inside of the system, $5,000. You can click on anywhere on the row except the X to open up that transaction. And when you open up the transaction, it's going to look like this. You'll notice that there's this little um, kind of like bubble or button here. And that lets you know the giving fund from Church 360 members. So I want to go back to Church 360 members just a second. And I'm going to go to the gear and go to funds. And this is our list of funds. Those are going to be the funds that you see um, based on color. There's color there. And those are going to be the funds that you see when you're inside a Church 360 ledger. So that's where that piece of information comes from. So building fund income, once you use the, um, once you use the kind of the transfer process from Church 360 members, it does remember the mapping. So the last time we did it, we mapped up building fund with general fund and mission fund. We mapped up all of those accordingly. By doing that, the next time, all I have to do is go over here and um, select my unrestricted, then select my building fund, and then select the mission fund at that point. So um, it'll leave the $5,000 up here. Lots of times what I'll do is I'll just take that $5,000 out. Yeah. There we go. Then I'll type in the dollar amount for each one of the line items. So $1,000 and then $3,000 up here. So 
Then once I'm done, I can add in a memo. Um, this is also Sunday offerings. Make sure my data is correct. And then I can save changes. If you're ever working with a deposit in Church 360 um, Ledger and you, you get halfway through it and you're like, I'm missing an account or this isn't quite right, you can just X out. It'll leave the deposit. Um, so I'm going to close that. It'll leave the deposit up here until you save the deposit. So if I need to stop for whatever reason, just click here. And then I could go back and, um, you know, go through the process of entering it in at that point in time. Okay, there we go. Building and mission. And the $1,000. So let me go ahead and click save at that point in time. So I saved it. I'm feeling pretty good about it. I'm like, man, this is working great, you know, perfect. Then I'm like, uh-oh, I made a mistake. I need to go back and make a change. Once the transaction's in the system, you can go back and change the transaction until one or two, one of two things takes place. One is you've reconciled the transaction, or two, you've printed the transaction, which be would be, of course, in relationship to checks. So if you needed to make a change, you could go back, click on the transaction. I usually click on the date so that I don't accidentally end up on one of these hyperlinks here on the right-hand side. So I usually click on the date. That'll allow me to come in here, edit the transaction, and make changes at that point in time. And we'll dig into um, some of these options down here at the bottom in just a minute. Okay, so that is our first transaction type, which is deposits. Next, let's take a look at checks. So we put money into our account. We are now ready to spend money. So the second type of transaction is going to be checks. Um, checks allow users to print checks or record handwritten checks. Either way is a possibility. And there we go. Um, they're used for payroll and for church bills. They give you the ability, they're able to print, um, they give you the ability to print laser checks and inkjet checks. So if you have a uh, laser printer, you can use that, or if you have an inkjet printer, you can use that as well. Um, and there's an option to actually purchase checks from Forms Plus Incorporated. And I think you guys spoke about that in the um, last training session. So, um, but you, you can purchase checks that match our software from the company Forms Plus Incorporated. And their website is, um, let's go back here. Their website is Forms Plus INC.com. So if you want to purchase checks, you, you can definitely purchase them from there. Um, and you go in here and you go to checks, and they have all of their checks here on this website. And then um, scroll down just a little bit, and then there's the ones for Church 360. And they could be the middle check, so it goes um, blank or stub, then the check, then the stub, or it could be stub, um, reverse that. It could be check, stub, stub. Okay. So let's go back to the PowerPoint. Um, so add, um, they're able to print laser and inkjet checks. And you can order from, oh, perfectly on time there. You can order checks from www dot forms plus inc dot com. Okay, so let's go, um, let's exit this screen and let's go to, um, go back to Church 360 Ledger. Okay, and okay, okay, so um, inside of here, let's go ahead and let's enter in checks. Um, thanks for those questions, Georgette. I will answer those in um, just a moment. Okay, thank you. Okay, so here inside of Church 360 Ledger, we'll go to new transaction and we'll go to we'll go to new transaction and we'll go to check. There we go. And when the check window comes up, it's going to look very similar to what we saw with the deposit window. And basically, you're going to fill out this top portion. And as you add in line items, the window will begin to push down. Um, and looking at it, there is this check blank in the middle, and the amount will show here on the right-hand side. So it'll kind of um, build as you go. And 
as you move down the list. So let's go ahead and let's write a check. Let's see here. There we go. Okay, so let's write a check for, let's do a simple payment at first. So what we're gonna do is for memo, and I like to do um, snow removal or lawn care or something like that. So, um, and looking at this, let's say that this is going to be a handwritten check and then we'll enter a couple checks into the system so that we can show different ways of entering in checks so with snow removal um say that we're having snow in september it's cold outside and we can select the company from the drop list for who's going to do the snow removal so if we have a snow removal company we can just select the company um, from the list you can also type in a name on the fly so if you're working with it and you're like, you know, hey, this one isn't in the list of vendors, the list of payees, you can type the name in on the fly and then it'll just add it to the list. The only drawback of doing that is the fact that when you type it in, it doesn't give you the chance to enter in address and contact information and things like that. So at this point, we can go to liabilities. Um, if we have a restricted fund, we'd want to select that restricted fund. So if people gave money for snow removal, we could select that restricted fund. Um, if this is unrestricted money, say unrestricted, say it's $100 to get the lot plowed, then we can go over to expense and um, find our snow removal account and then select that. And then um, that would literally be the end of our check at that point in time. So down here it would show pay to the order of, it'll give the address, it'll have our memo, and it'll have the dollar amount here on the right hand side so then um, at that point in time what we can do is click save we look over our check everything looks correct okay and then um, you'll notice at the top and it disappeared on me just that quick but you'll notice at the top there's a notification and it'll speak to you hey this check has been added to the check queue you can click the print queue at that point in time and it'll take you into the print queue. If you're um, a little slow on the draw there and getting to the click, you can click here and then that'll take you into the print queue as well. And then you can see our transaction for central trust checking. So, I mean, then we can literally print that check um, from here or we can mark it as printed. So I wanna enter in one more transaction before I show the process of printing or marking an item as printed. So, and, I'm, and there's a few other transactions and we're gonna take care of those as well. So I'm gonna go back to new transaction and go to check. And this time we're gonna do a payroll check. Now, some churches will take care of their own payroll there inside the church and some churches will have a third party take care of their payroll. And that could be a situation where they're importing a paychecks payroll file into church 360 ledger so we're going to say hey we're a small church and we're just going to manually enter in our payroll so say that this is and i'm going to say that this is a salary check so i'm going to say that this is salary for um we'll say august since september isn't over with yet and then our payee is going to be mr woods derek woods here then um, from there, I'll go through and I'll select the um, line items that I need. And with Derek Wood's paycheck, he is going to, um, he's actually paying taxes. So I want to show how the tax process works here. So in looking at this on the left-hand side, we'll select our unrestricted checking, central trust checking. And then below that, on the left-hand side, we're going to enter in our liabilities. So I'm gonna start with um, our federal income tax. Then I'm gonna do state income tax. Then I'm going to do social security. Then after that, Medicare. And all of those items are gonna be here on the left-hand side. So usually I type the items first and then I go back and do unrestricted. So with federal income tax, 95.10 then liability $22 um, liability state income tax $22 social security 5167 
and Medicare is going to be 1208. Okay. So then from there, I can go up to the top. The um, amount of their check that they're, they're actually take home amounts is going to be 652.48. And then the total expense is going to be 833. And that's going to come out of our staff salary account. When you're setting up your chart of accounts, we set this up with just one salary account. So all the salary comes out of this one account. You can create multiple um, expense accounts and group them together using a category. So you could have a have an account for pastor's salary, one for secretary's salary, one for the organist, um, one for the church council president. You could have multiple salary accounts and roll them all up into um, into a category, and then you'll be able to see the total amount for the whole year. But um, basically, we just kind of simplified ours. So then at that point, if we scroll down the screen, you'll be able to see those credits and debits. So in looking at it, we'll see that we credited our checking account and the credit, um, as we know, is gonna be a decrease. We're also crediting our liabilities, but we know by our debits and credits chart that a credit on a liability is the reverse. That's gonna be an increase. So we're increasing our liability balances. And basically, we're holding on to that money until it's time to pay the government whatever amount we're supposed to pay them. Okay, so credit, credit, credit. And then down here, we have a debit that's on our expense account, and that's going to be an increase as well. We notice at the bottom that both sides balance. So then at that point, we'll click Save. And actually, I want to change the date to Friday. So I'm going to say Friday the 21st is when we're writing this check. So I'm going to click save. Then once it saves, it's going to, I'm going to click that quickly this time so I can show that. So print queue, then that's going to take me into the print queue. And that did not, ref oh, I was already on that screen. Let me click there to reload the screen. That should have updated. Okay. There we go. So now we're seeing all of the transactions. And if this is a handwritten check, say we wrote a handwritten check, on the left-hand side, we'll check the box. Then we'll click Mark as Printed. And when you mark it as printed, one check will be removed from the print queue. It has not been printed. Are you sure you want to remove it? And the answer is going to be yes. We're going to confirm it. And it's going to give you a summary of the transaction. So if it's just one transaction, there'll be one line. If there's 20, there'll be 20 lines here. So I'm going to confirm it, and that's just going to take it out of the print queue. So let's go to the home screen here just for a second. If a check has not been printed, then it'll have this unprinted icon here on the left-hand side. And if a check has been printed or removed from the print queue, it will not have an icon here on the left-hand side. So um, that that's the result you'll get. Um, also, you won't be able to, you know, if you print the check, you won't be able to make changes. So let's go back to our print queue. And um, we have check number 5001 already on this check. That's OK. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to check these boxes, and then I'm going to click Print. And when I go to print the checks, it's going to um, find my highest check number and start increasing from there. So this one is 5002. Um, I can go through and review my check. You'll notice how. It has the um, check in the, uh, this is actually the check at the top. So it has the check at the top, then it has stub, followed by stub. And then as we scroll down, we'll see the check, stub, stub, and we can actually review these checks. Once we've um, gone through, so um, we have 5,002, 5,003. This one's going to be 5,001 because that's what we entered when we were actually entering the check. And then um, 5,005. So, one, two, three, four, five. Okay, so it looks like I, I had another 504 in the past. So, that number's been used. If I want to change my check numbers, I can click print. And I can go ahead and in here and I can actually change the check numbers. So, um, if, if there's something that's not correct, I can modify it and say that these are in the wrong order, you know, and I want this one to be 5,001, 
um, the one below that to be 5002, 5003, 5004. Um, I can change them at that point as well. So it'll try to put the correct check number on there. If you're not satisfied with that check number, you, you can definitely make changes. So I'm going to go ahead and click continue at this point. Then it's going to take the checks and pass them off to our check print view. Give it just a second there. Okay. Then um, if we need to modify the margins, we can. Um, we can go in and select a different printer, and then we can click print. Once we click print, it'll actually send it off to the printer at that point in time. Um, we can retrieve the checks from the printer. If all of them printed fine, we'll mark them as printed. If some of them didn't print, then um, we'll uncheck the ones that didn't print correctly, and then mark the other ones as printed at that point in time. So I'm gonna go ahead and mark that one as printed as well because they all did print. Okay, okay, so there. Um, there's um, a couple questions and I'm gonna to have to go back and catch up on a few of these as well. Um, let's see. So how do you record um, from David? Hello, David. How do you record checks if you hand write them? If you hand write a check, you'll go um, new transaction, you'll go to check, you'll enter in the check and you'll save it just like a normal check. Then when you go to your check queue, you'll mark the check as printed. So that's how you'll record a handwritten check. Um, there's a follow-up question from David. What about employer share of social security? That's a really good question. So we took care of the employee portion of the social security when we created our check for mr woods there um when it comes time for the employer portion of that that will be written out of an expense account so when you write the check to social security you'll use um, three line items one's going to be the checking account and then one's going to be the um and actually, let me show that transaction. We're still talking about checks, so it's perfect timing. So new transaction, check. And when it comes time to pay Social Security, what you'll do is you'll select unrestricted over here. And let's say it was $200. So then on the right-hand side, you'll select the liability account for Social Security tax. And then you'll select the employer account, employ, yep, employer account for Social Security tax. So and this, this should be 100, and this should be 100. So the employer portion of the Social Security or these taxes is paid out of expenses. Okay. Um, another question from Georgette. Hello, Georgette. Nice to hear from you. Um, is it okay to leave the checks in the queue? And it is okay to leave the checks in the queue. Um, let me move this over here. There's lots of churches um, that I've spoken to where, you know, you go into their print queue and there's, you know, 100 items in the print queue. It doesn't break anything to leave those checks in the print queue. Um, and there's people who leave them in the print queue until somebody else pulls them out of the print queue. Um, and I don't know if this is the case for Georgette, but lots of times people like to leave them in the print queue because it gives them a chance to make changes to the transaction. And then they basically um, clear out those at the end of the year. So, and that might be the case for Georgette, but um, that's what I'm hearing from customers. They want to leave them there so that they can tweak the um, transactions if they need to. Okay. Okay. So that is entering in checks. Um, once you've printed the checks, we'll go back to the home screen here just for a second. And um, Inside of the home screen, we'll now see that the little um, locks or the little locks, the little unprint icons are no longer there. Okay. Okay, so that is entering in a check. After checks, I like to go to payments. Payments represent doing electronic transactions. So let's go back to my slideshow here and talk about payments for a second. Payments allow users to record online or electronic transactions. For years and years, everything we did was a handwritten check. Um, then we started 
paying for things with debit cards and credit cards and um, even online and that's what these are supposed to represent so if it's something where you don't write a check you're going to use a payment um, these are limited to assets liabilities and expense accounts and um, examples are going to be where you're doing EFTs for your utility bills, payments for bank fees, et cetera. So um, basically those things where you don't write checks. So I'm going to go ahead and switch back to Church 360 Ledger, new transaction under payments. And the payment that I want to show is paying the electric bill. So um, let's say that this is for, and pro we're probably a little late for August um, payment. So this is the August payment for electricity. But um, our um, let's say that we wrote, are uh, we entering this in as of today? And um, in our area, it's a company called Amarin. So enter in Amarin. On the left hand side, we would say unrestricted and say our bill was um, $376.23. Then over here, we would select our electric company. And we'd say electric. Now, when people are setting up their chart of accounts, it's a best practice to name the account what it was for and to not name the account the vendor. So I, I see that at times where people have gone in and they've named their electric account Amarin UE, but it really should be Amarin is the payee and electric is the purpose or the reason. So um, please be careful with that. So then from there, you can fill in additional line items. You'll click save and it will save your transaction. And the difference between the check and the payment is the check or reverse that. The payment is going to show up directly in your system without having to go into the print queue. So it's just gonna, it's just gonna show up and it's gonna be accessible and ready at that point in time. You'll notice that our deposits are black over here so in the black, and then our decreases are going to be um, in red, like check and payment. So those are going to decrease the items. Okay, so that is um, how to enter a payment. They're very similar to checks, but you're going to want to enter these transactions when you're when you're not handwriting a check or printing a check out of the system. Um, one little step I did skip when I was entering in checks, I didn't show entering in a check number. Um, and that might be where David was going from um, earlier. And I might've just kind of missed that. If it is a handwritten check, you will know the check number. So say that we were still paying our electric bill by, um, by check, by handwritten check. So this could be, um, let's say that we'll go back one month. So let's say that this is July's um, electric bill. And um, we could say Amarin here, okay? And then you could um, type in the check number. So say this was 5006. And then um, unrestricted um, electricity is higher in the summer. Let's say it's 512. And then this could be an electric over here. And this is a handwritten check. So then we could click save. With it being a handwritten check, you would go to our print queue. Um, it already has the check number. You'll check the box over here and you'll just mark it as printed. Then um, we would say confirm. So th that's how you would do the handwritten check. I understand what you're saying now, David. Sorry for the confusion there. Okay, so let's go back to our slideshow. And after payments is gonna be transfers, Transfers are used to represent electronic transfers between banks and to make line item corrections. So, um, and I would say there's one other thing that, um, that transfers allow you to do. For churches who are starting out with the software, the transfers will allow you to enter in your initial balances for your restricted funds. So you'll use a transfer to transfer money from unrestricted too, um, too restricted. And that's what this second line item is speaking to. Um, it only allows moving money between similar account types. So that means you can move money from expense to expense and it will allow you to move money from asset to asset. So only allows moving money between similar account types. So um, let's go ahead and we'll come back um, to journal entries here um, right after our intermission. So to enter in a transfer, 
you'll go to new transaction and go down to transfer. And then at that point, it'll allow you to transfer money between similar account types. Once you select the first account type, it'll automatically default the second account type. So if you're entering the beginning balance for the building fund, you would select unrestricted here on the left. You could type in whatever the amount, um, the balance of the building fund, um, say it's $12,000. And then you're basically restricting the money by typing the $12,000 over on the right-hand side. It would decrease the unrestricted balance on your central trust checking, and it would increase the balance of your building fund. So and then at that, um, that point, so you would make sure the date is correct. Um, if this is an initial balance, you definitely want that to be back at the first of, um, at the start of your fiscal year. So. Um, I could say January 1 here. This system's been in place for quite a while, but you know that wouldn't be the start. But you could say that that's the start, and then you just would transfer the money. Um, that's a really good example there. Um, fixing line items. If you enter in a transaction and you need to correct the line item, so say you really meant to, um, like you you put the money into electric, but it really it was supposed to be for the um, natural gas bill. So with this being on the left-hand side, say it was $245, you'll notice how that's a credit. A credit to an expense account is a decrease. And then over here, 245, that would be a debit to the expense account and that would be an increase. And this could be a line item, line item adjustment. And then click save and then that would save that transaction for you then excuse me you go back to the home screen here and you'll be able to see that line item correction and that, oh, actually you won't see it here you would have to go into the expense account because the home screen is only going to show assets and liabilities so um, if we went to electric here then um, in looking at this screen, you'd see that adjustment and it decreasing $245 there. Okay, so that's a transfer. Let's go ahead and take our um, short five minute intermission. And when we resume, we'll talk, about, um, we'll talk about journal entries. We'll show the reports inside the system now that we have transactions. We'll show bank account reconciliation and a couple other things. Okay. So let me switch gears here, and I'm actually going to jump forward on my slides and then um, jump back here just one second. Okay, I hope everybody enjoys the intermission.
Hello everyone, welcome back. Go ahead and um, switch back to our presentation here. And what I want to do is go back a couple of slides here. There we go. And we should be on the journal entry slide. So journal entries are going to allow users to record account balances, corrections, um, interest earned and bank fees, bank fees, et cetera. And the great thing about journal entries is they can utilize all four account types. So um, there's no restrictions on these. If you have a situation where one of the other transaction types are not um, allowing you to do whatever it is you want to do, you can do that with journal entries. And um, it kind of goes back to situations where people want to use liability accounts um, as a form of dedicated account, or they want to use a liability account to um, track their restricted funds, this could be done um, with the use of journal entries or with the help of journal entries. So um, those are the two line items for um, two um, talking points for transactions. Let's go ahead and go back to Church 360 Ledger, and we'll create a, um, a couple of transactions here. Um, so let's go to journal entries. Um, journal entries, you'll need your um, debits and credits chart. Hopefully everyone wrote that down. Um, and the transactions that I want to show here for, uh, let me grab this right here. For the couple that I want to show here is going to be one, um, doing bank interest or um, doing bank fees. So to enter in your bank interest or bank fees, say we were entering in the bank interest for um, for September, like like this is the amount of interest we earned um, for September. We're getting close to the end of the year, end of the month. So so let's say bank interest. To enter in your bank interest, you can select the date that you received it. Um, there's really no payee for bank interest because you're not paying out or anything. Um, but you can say unrestricted, and that's where the money is going to be coming into. And then you can also select your um, interest income account. So this is going to track all the interest that you received during the year. So in looking at this, um, we'll look at our credits and debits chart. So to increase your asset account, you're going to debit the account. So the interest that you earned, say it was... Um, say it was 27 cents, you know, and then you would go and you would balance your transaction. You go over to your credits and then put in um, 27 cents. So you don't have to type the zero before you type in the amount. So um, lots of times I'll just skip the zero and I'll say dot 27 or whatever it is. So you don't have to type the zero. If you like the zero, feel free to type that in um, to increase our income account. That's going to be a credit. So, um, and I'll jump back to that slide just one second to show the credits and debits there. So, here we go. So, um, to increase our asset account, that's going to be a debit. And to increase our income account, that's going to be a credit. Okay. So, we've done that correctly. We are balanced. We click save. Then, once it's saved, if we go into, we can go to the Omni bar here at the top. We can say um, income interest and actually reverse that, it's interest income. And we've increased by 27 cents. So we went from 57 cents to 84 cents at that point. So that's the way you can enter in interest income. Um, we can also show bank fees. So if we go to new transaction and go down to journal entries, bank fees is basically the opposite of that. So let's say that the, um, bank fees, and we'll say that these are the bank fees for September. And we could have a payee on that if we wanted to. So um, if we wanted to say Central Trust Bank was the uh, payee on that, we could. Then from there, select unrestricted and then select bank fees down here at the bottom. And then we're going to reverse it. A credit is a decrease. So if our bank fees were $7.99, then we can go to $7.99 here. 
and then click save and then that would save that transaction so let me switch back to our um, view here a credit is going to be a decrease and on the asset account and a debit is going to be an increase on the expense account so um, there we go so then we'll click save and if we go to our bank account so say we go to home here then we go to central trust checking then when we look inside of that account we'll see our 7.99 right here and then we'll see our 27 cents right here so one is increasing and one is decreasing okay so those are a couple common journal entries if you have a complex journal entry that you'd like me to um, do, please post that in the um, question box and I'll, I'll be willing to um, walk you through that transaction. So let's go ahead and transition into reports. Now, inside of Church 360 Ledger, when it comes to reports, you can go to the reports icon here at the top and these are gonna be the canned reports, like there's gonna be the general ledger report. Um, there's gonna be the statement of income and expense, there's gonna be the chart of accounts report, and there's gonna be the balance sheet report. So um, with the general ledger report, this report is gonna be um, a report that shows you all of the line items inside of your system. And um, when it comes to all of those line items, it'll be running you know, top to bottom, newest at the top, oldest at the bottom, and it gives you the ability to jump over and take a look at that um, account or that payee by clicking on the hyperlinks. The little down triangles allow you to select the types of transactions you wanna see. So if you're looking just for all of the line items that were applied to checks, you can unclick all and then you can click check and it will allow you to at that point to see all of the checks. Um, also, you can do that same thing for payees and you can do that for accounts. So if I'm trying to find all the line items that were written to, and I'll uncheck all here and say that I wanted to do um, Derek Woods. So these would be all the checks we've written to Derek Woods. Then at that point, I've got check and I've got payee and these are the line items written to Derek Woods. Now, um, lots of times when we're looking at this, we just want to consider staff salary or we just want to consider the checking account we can also go to account and then uncheck all and then just select our checking account and he would have been written a check for 652 dollars and another check for 652 dollars so um, those would be basically our check register at this point in time if we want to see additional accounts we can or we could you know eliminate accounts so in looking at this um, we can switch payee back to all and we can group by using the little chain link here. And then that will allow you to group together by um, payee or by account. So in looking at this, this would be an example of a check register here because it allows you to see how much came out of the check account, checking account. So AT&T, they received 6547, 65, $65 and $50. And um, then the Allied Trash, our trash company, received 35, 35, and 50. So um, it gives you a chance to just find that information and kind of filter down to what you're really looking for. Now, when you tweak and modify your views, you can still in, um, send the information to Excel where you can make additional changes if you'd like. Give that just one second. There it goes. Okay, and that's coming up on my other screen. Give that just a moment. Oh, there it goes. Okay. Okay, so then once um, it's pulled up, if you needed to make any changes or eliminate anything, you could just go in here and use the full force of um, of Microsoft Excel at that point in time. Now, it does um, include voided transactions. And you'll see that it has the voided date over here. And um, at that point, 
you know, if it's voided, it should have um, kind of like a slight tint or change in color. So, um, and I don't know if, let me, un, let me clear this back. All One more second there. Here we go. So this should be all, all, then I'll unhyperlink there. Okay, so if you scroll down and um, you see this one right here, Cordia, Concordia Health Plans, and you can kind of see how it has this pinkish, um, reddish hue behind the, um, behind the transaction. That lets you know that that transaction is voided. So, I um, mean, you'll probably see some other ones that we've shown, um, showed voiding in the past. So, um, to void a transaction, you'll actually go to the orange dollar sign. You'll um, find the transaction, click on the transaction, and you'll click on the void button, and then that will allow you to void the transaction. Um, lots of times people like to use the copy button because that allows you to copy the transaction and create the transaction. But, um, you know, if you need to get rid of it because a mistake's been made or the transaction is no longer needed, you can definitely void the transaction. And say that um, I did September, but say you needed to create this same transaction for the upcoming month or the following month, you could go to copy. And then this says um, you're creating a copy. You can say September, let's say October. We'll go into the future on this one and change this to October 27th. And then click save and it'll create that transaction. So probably you don't, you know, create these types of transactions in the future, but if you needed to create a transaction, you can copy the transaction and that's the point. So then we can go here to general ledger, or go to reports and go to general ledger, and we can see all of our line items and even those ones that we've entered into the future. Okay, so that's how you can use the general ledger report. Um, with the general ledger report and being able to be used with Microsoft Excel, um, you can also use pivot tables in Excel and um, you can do quite a few amazing things. So, but if there's a report you'd like me to create based on transactions, just let me know. Okay, so then from there, the next report is going to be the statement of income and expense report. And this report compares your income versus expense. It's gonna compare the money that was brought into the church versus the money that's going out. And looking at this transaction, or in looking at this report, um, it's gonna be a summary. And so you're not seeing assets, you're not seeing liabilities, you're not seeing restricted funds, you're literally seeing money coming in and going out. Um, some people like to think of it as profit and loss, um, different types of things, but it really it's the total amount of income, the total amount of money brought in versus the amount going out. Now, it's gonna say income, um, unrestricted offerings. You can collapse those areas. So depending on your audience, you might wanna say, hey, I just want to show summaries by um, categories instead of showing every single line item. The big benefit of that is it shortens your report. So you don't end up with a really long report. Um, so, and then you'll notice how we have a restricted income category. That allows us to see the total amount of income that came in that was restricted versus the total amount of income that came in that was unrestricted. So there's quite a bit of a difference there. So when you're looking at it, there's definitely people who don't want to see restricted money on the statement of income and expense. One way of doing that is creating a category and then exporting the report to Excel and deleting that row out of the report. And I'm going to show that here just one second. So I'm going to say, I'm going to collapse support staff, church expenses, miscellaneous church grounds, and then we have Oregon down here. Oregon isn't pulled up into a category. So it's just kind of, um, excuse me, it's just kind of sitting here out on its own. So um, this is probably how I would um, generate or print the report. So at this point, um, I'm going to show print on this one. So if I go to print, that will allow us to send the report to a print view. Then we'd be able to print here in just a second. So as it comes up, this is what the report would look like. Um, it'll send it to the print view, then it'll flip over and 
pull up your um, default printing options for your web browser. And at that point, once again, you'll see it here in this window and you'll be able to you know, select your printer and make changes if, if you need to. So I'm gonna close that window. And um, inside this view, there are people lots of times who want to um, customize or tweak the statement of income and expense. To do that, you'll just send the report to Microsoft Excel and you'll be able to tweak it at that point in time. Um, the reports we have, we call those our four core reports. They're the main reports inside the system and they allow you to do all kinds of things with these reports. You can tweak them and collapse items, and collapse line items. But if there's like a very um, specific report that your church uses, um, it can be created in Microsoft Excel. Okay. So in looking at this, um, we have this report and um, I'll enable editing. In, in working with this report, you'll notice how the restricted income is down here at the bottom. And what I'm going to do is just right click and delete that line. When I delete that line, since um, a control Z and right click, that's not the items below it. Let me unhide these lines here. So, okay. So um, inside of there, this top row is a sum. So if you look up here at the top, so if I delete that top row, it's um, escape it's deleting that category. Category sum things together. Um, I still have these accounts down here that I need to delete. And when I delete those accounts, it does break my formulas. But when it comes to those formulas, they're really easy to fix. Um, I basically deleted the additional rows that were being added in. So if I, if I um, clear out that top section, clear out the um, broken references, press enter, it'll save it. Then all I have to do is drag this over here since these two um, are basically the same and dragging it from here to here is gonna allow it to um, continue to calculate the way that it should. So this is um, referencing column B here and then this is referencing column C here. So, um, you know, delete the refs, um, the broken references and then pull it over and your report's fixed at that point. It's no longer showing the um, restricted income at that point in time. And then, um, you know, down at the bottom, it'll calculate it accordingly as well. So you'll be good to go at that point in time. Okay, so I'm gonna close this um, statement of income and expense. Then I'm gonna go to reports and go to the chart of accounts report. And we have about five minutes till 11.30 and I kind of want to uh, make a short announcement. It looks like I probably have another 15 minutes to go and we'll be closer to 1.45, 1.45, 12, 11.45 for completing this uh, session. So if you have to drop off, please feel free to do so. You can definitely, um, you, you can definitely watch the video. We'll be uploading it to YouTube. So, so after the um, income and expense report, there's the chart of accounts report. And that report allows you to view your chart of accounts. And the chart of accounts report will show you all of the accounts in your chart of accounts. It'll also show the starting balances, ending balances, debits versus credits, your change plus minus and your change percent. Um, you can set this to whatever date range that you want. And all these reports have the option for exporting to Excel, printing and selecting a date range. So if I wanted to see the last full complete month, say the month of August, I can click on August and that will narrow us down just to August. And then once again, I can collapse our sections if we need to. Um, it does show the debits and credits. So this could be treated as a um, trial balance report since it's showing the debits and credits. And um, it can show your change plus minus. So let me go back one month further there we go. And um, there's a few more transactions there, but um, you can kind of see how you're um, trending and proceeding at that point in time. Now, it does include your restricted fund. So like we have the building fund. And the main reason why people use the restricted funds is so that when you're um, looking at it, you can see the starting balance and the ending balance. This keeps a running balance of your building fund when you're working with your income and expense accounts, those zero out at the end of the year. 
and by them zeroing out, they leave you without the um, they, they leave you without the running balance. So you definitely want to use restricted funds if you want to find the running balance. The fourth and final report is going to be the balance sheet report. And the balance sheet report allows you to compare your assets versus your liabilities. And um, lots of times people will look at the balance sheet and say that um, this is the financial health of the congregation because assets are going to be what you um, what you have, um, cash, property, things like that, what you own, and liabilities is going to be what you owe. So inside our church, our starting balance was $430,000 for assets, $72,000 for liabilities, and then um, ending balance $430,000 and $73,000. So we um, kind of stayed pretty steady there. The change is just $349. Um, with with liabilities, it's always not something, you know, it's not always like a debt, you know, sometimes it's just money that you owe out to the government. So it's not like you may, you may not have any major loans or anything like that. So this is the balance sheet report. Okay, so why don't we go ahead and let's do a bank account reconciliation. So I have my bank statement here. And with the bank account reconciliation, to perform a bank account reconciliation, you'll go to the orange dollar sign at the top in most cases, but then you'll drill down into your checking account. So you'll go to assets, then um, go to your category if you have a category for your account. So ours is central trust, and then we'll go to checking, and then we'll go to central trust checking. So inside of there, once you're all the way down to the um, appropriate level, then you'll have the button for reconcile here on the right hand side or in the middle of your screen. Now in looking at this, I set my date to July just a minute ago. The system remembers the date that you've selected. So you'll wanna change that to the appropriate um, date range. And I'm gonna reconcile the month of January. And um, when you're working with the um, date selector, you're going to want to make sure to select the date range that includes all of the transactions on your bank statement. So sometimes you got to go back, um, you know, a couple weeks or a couple months. So if someone holds on to a check for, for you know, um, 60 days and then they cash it, you'll have to go back 60 days to include that. Um, this is all sample data, so I'm just going to use um, the month of January. Then at that point, I'm gonna click reconcile. And to reconcile, the statement date is gonna be the date of the, um, I guess you could say the newest transaction. So it could be today's date or it could be um, January 1 there, or January 31. And then I'm gonna enter in the starting balance. So we started at 171. 171, 264, 71. And then our ending balance is 167, 073, 073, 86. So starting balance, ending balance, the statement difference is the difference between these two numbers. The selected difference, and I'm just going to click this transaction here, the selected difference is the amount of the items that you've selected. So select a check, select a deposit, and um, it'll give you the difference between those two. And when you hover over it, it's going to show you checks and deposits and give you the total for your checks and deposits. The off by is the difference between the selected difference and the um, between the statement difference and the selected difference. So with this, um, with this bank statement, I'm going to start at the um, bottom. And I'm going to select the um, transactions that I need to select. You can click directly on the checkbox or you can just click on the row. And um, if you're using restricted funds, it is necessary to select all of the line items for that transaction. And you'll just go through and select each one of the line items. And as you're selecting, usually what I'll do is I'll put a little um, check on the piece of paper stating that I've selected that item. 
And then that, that helps me know that I've clicked it here on my screen and I've also selected the item. <coughs> and excuse me. So then from there, I'll go through and keep selecting my transactions and my line items there. Okay. Um, if I'm going through and I'm selecting my line items, then all of a sudden I get to a point and I say, hey, you know what? Um, I need to review a transaction and make a change. Whatever you do, unless you're ready to start over, do not click the cancel button. What you're going to want to do is to click the orange dollar sign here at the top. And by clicking the orange dollar sign, that will take you out of the reconciliation where you can go in and edit um, a transaction. Um, and that's if it hasn't been printed. So it would have to be something that I hadn't printed. Let's say this deposit. Um, so you could go in and make a change to the transaction. Then you could go back into your, um, you could go back into your account. Let's go back up and we'll go to um, central trust checking here. And then you can go to reconcile and then resume your reconciliation at that point. So AT&T, let's see here. Meridian News Magazine, Missouri. Okay. Okay. Okay, so the off buy is now zero. So that gives me the ability to um, save the reconciliation. I'm going to uncheck this one right here just for a second. If the balance is not zero, it won't allow you to click save. So once the balance is zero, you will be able to click save. Um, you know, going through and checking to make sure all the balances are correct for every single transaction is critically important. I kind of went through that pretty quickly, but I would say, hey, when you're doing a bank account reconciliation, you want to put a check mark on your piece of paper, and you're also checking to make sure that the balances are correct. So once you save it, that will um, lock your transactions. It'll put a little reconcile lock on here but it'll also give you the option to print out a bank account reconciliation report. To print that report, you'll go to the gear here. Um, I'm sorry, you'll go to reports and you'll go down to event log. And underneath event log, you're gonna have all of your events based on the date range that you have selected. So since I set that to January 1, I need to, um, this is September, so I can go to September and I can see all of the, um, events that have taken place. So there will be one for reconciling your bank. So you can click there. And um, once you click there, you'll be able to see the line items. You'll be able to click print and you'll be able to print out this report. And this represents your bank account reconciliation report. There's a couple other reports that I would like to show. And these reports are um, not one of the canned reports, but it's um, by design, what they did with this software was just about every single view has a print button. So if I go back to the orange dollar sign here at the top, you'll notice here inside of the transactions view, the home screen view, that you can export to Excel or you can click on print and you can print a view. And a common request I get is tied to, hey, I want to see all of the line items or transactions for one single account and say we want to um, do some research on the building fund so inside of here we're saying building fund and we have um, our building fund restricted building fund income and building fund here for building with expenses and you definitely want to use like the suffixes if you're using restricted funds because they'll help you easily identify whether or not it's income um, restricted or expense. Um, it does say expense right there, but it might be a little hard to read. So in looking at it, I like to put the um, abbreviation here. Then when I click on that account, I can see all the transactions that went through that account for the time period that I have selected. So let's say 2018. Then from there, it's going to have a trend line that represents your budget. And then it's going to have, you know, how it's increasing during that time period. 
and we can see that there's um, the amount of income brought in this year is 4600 um, 4690 if I want to look at the restricted fund so building restricted then from there um, this is how much money we have over the long run for the building fund so there's 21,000 so we, obviously we've spent some money on building projects this year um, Oh, actually reverse that. We have brought in more money um, over the years, but we haven't spent that much because we still have this balance of $21,000 here. So the income's only a few thousand dollars, but we have $20,000 um, over the long haul and we're approaching our, um, I guess our destination for that new building. Okay, so that's um, that report. You can also, go to um, go to the gear and go to budgets and the budgets has an export to excel option that's considered a report because it gives you the ability to um, it gives you the ability to export it out and kind of um, I guess hand the sheets out and then people can take a look at it and they can plan from these numbers and it works out well being able to see how much you budgeted month to month to month to month um, if you're just, you know, kind of, I guess, um, we call it peanut butter spread where you're making it an even layer across all of the months, then, um, you know, printing this isn't so important. But if you're, you know, going up and down, then printing it, you know, is important at that point. So that's one, um, that's one of the final reports there. The last one I like to show is under payees. And when you're in payees, you'll notice there's a history button that kind of floats, it appears. Um, if we go to Ammer and Electric, we can click on the history button, and then that shows us the history for the time period that we have selected, and it'll be um, up and down. So basically, we've got the zero for gas because that's we because we did a transaction to transfer the money. Our zero here, but twenty dollars here. So hmm, that twenty should not be there. That get, that lets us know that we need to make a correction. That's what that tells us. So um, unrestricted and electric, and then we can see how much we've um, credited and debited, and that can help us with our um, with our 1090s if we need to. So okay, so that is that's the end of the information that I had for this um, for this presentation. Let's go ahead and switch back to our um, to our PowerPoint. Give me just one second. Here we go. And we're going to go to our quiz at this point in time. And actually, I have one more slide I want to show. Um, and it was the voiding transaction. I kind of went in and showed voiding transactions there. But I have a slide. So um, that slide's going to you know, include a little additional information. So voiding a transaction cancels the effect of a transaction. So um, one thing like I showed, hey, you can void a transaction by going here, but when you're voiding a transaction, it's actually reversing what you did. So um, it's canceling the effects of that transaction. It's not um, deleting it out or anything like that. That's why we see it on the general ledger report. Um, it also allows you to, um, actually it creates a hidden reversing transaction and groups the two transactions together. So. Um, every single thing you do in Church 360 Ledger is tracked, and especially when it comes to entering in transactions and changing transactions, it's keeping this big, long running balance, and that's how they decided to make sure that everything was being held accountable. So um, it works out well. Um, this cannot be undone, so if you void a transaction, you have to go in and at that point, simply um, if you avoid a transaction at that point then you just have to re-enter the transaction so it cannot be undone okay so let's go ahead and go to our quiz so quiz and um, i set the polls up for our quiz question there we go so question number one um here we go true or false Handwritten checks will appear in the print queue along with checks to be printed.
Okay, it looks like everybody has voted. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and close the poll and share the results. So we had a 75-25 split here. So I'm going to hide the results and share the answer. The answer is true. All checks are sent to the print queue. Um, to, remove a, to remove a handwritten check from the print queue, click the box to the left of the check and click um, the as or and click hmm, and click the mark as printed button. Awesome. Okay. So next question. True or false? When creating a journal entry, applying a credit to a bank account will decrease the account balance. True or false? When creating a journal entry, applying a credit to a bank account will decrease the account balance. And we have our um, credits and debits chart there, so we'll be able to um, we'll be able to take a look and see if that is a true statement or not. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and close the poll and share the results. And it looks like we, once again, we had a 75-25 split. So I'm going to hide the results and share the answer. Of course, the answer is true. A credit to an asset will decrease the account balance while a debit will increase the account balance. Okay, and that can be found on the debits and credits chart. Okay, question number three. This one's about the chart of accounts. True or false, the chart of accounts report can be used as a trial balance report. So true or false. Okay. Okay, it looks like everybody has voted. I'll go ahead and close the poll and share the results. Okay, and look, we were unanimous, perfect. 100% of the people said true. Good job, everyone. Hide the results and share the answer. And the answer is true. This report shows the total credits and debits for each account. For specific sums or totals, the reports can be exported to Excel and modified. Question number four. Once again, um, and actually this is not true or false, this is multiple choice. So you're working with the bank account reconciliation and you find out that you need to enter a transaction, what should you do? A, click the save button. B, click the cancel button. Or C, click the orange dollar sign. A, B, or C. No, oh, okay. Looks like everybody's voted there. Perfect. I'll go ahead and close the poll and share the results. And we were unanimous. We chose C. Click the orange dollar sign button. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and show the answer. Of course, the answer is C. Click the home button, orange dollar sign. This will take you out of the reconciliation and not delete your work. Once the transaction has been entered, just open the reconciliation and continue clearing transactions. Only click cancel if you want to start over. So please don't click cancel unless you want to start over. Okay. And then the fifth and final um, quiz question, true or false, to print a reconciliation report, go to the event log. Oh, thank you so much, Georgette. I appreciate it. Talk to you soon. Okay, we'll give it a few more moments there.
Okay, it looks like everybody has voted. I'll go ahead and close the poll and share the results. We had a 75-25 split. That's a common split today. So I will hide the results and show the answer. And the answer is true. A bank account reconciliation can only be printed from the event log. Okay, do you have any questions? Let me go back and let's see here. So there were some of them that I didn't get to. There's, um, hello, Georgia. Let me actually, let me, let me do this first, then I'll make sure to answer all those questions. Um, people start to drop off pretty quickly at the end of the webinar. And I want to thank everybody for attending today's Church 360 webinar. And we truly hope you enjoyed today's session. And of course, if you have any questions afterwards, we'd love to hear from you. Um, of course, you can give us a call, 1-800-346-6120. And you can shoot us an email at support um, at cts.cph.org. So there was a question from Georgette. Is it necessary to enter the transactions on both sides because I never entered both sides? Um, is this wrong? Um, I, th I think what you're talking about is when we're entering in the, um, and let me switch screens here. So like when we're entering in a new transaction and like we're doing a deposit, um, is it necessary to enter it in on both sides? That's a really good question. It's not required that you use restricted funds. So if you're not restricting the money, then you can just um, enter in the restrictions over here on, or enter in the income accounts over here on the right-hand side. So it's not required. Uh, let's see here. Um, I think, um, like, um, Georgette, where it says, maybe that's why I have two entries for some payments. Um, will this be hard to correct? I don't think it'll be hard to correct. Um, you can definitely um, go to my onboarding calendar, and you can schedule a, ses um, schedule a session, and we can, we can dig into that. I don't think it'll be hard to correct. Um, perfect. Perfect. Okay. It looks like... It looks like that's the end of the questions there. So um, if there aren't any other questions, um, I really appreciate everybody attending and thank you for all your patience. Um, okay. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and sign off. And of course you can, you can let us know if you have any questions. So for James Bowman, this is Rod Kyles. We are signing off. I hope everybody has a wonderful afternoon. Thanks, everyone.